hurt me. Well, it's been a while, folks, but I'm back, and it couldn't be a better time, because it's fighting game month here on Anime Abandon. Yes, the one genre that unites all gamers from all walks of life together to beat the ever-loving crap out of each other. From inception to today, fighting games have been a staple of the video game landscape, pitting friend against friend, rival against rival, and sexist idiots against sexist idiots. You know, I'm hoping that since she's a woman, she's also a white woman, you know, we can use that to our advantage, because everyone likes white women. Despite the decorum that the genre has garnered itself, it hasn't been able to translate itself very well into anime. you think the two would go hand in hand, but time and time again they keep missing the mark. We've covered four different anime fighting game adaptations over the course of the show, and all of them aren't what you'd call seminal classics. Hell, the best one was probably Fatal Fury. At least that one had some camp charm to it. So I wanted to open the month on a memorable note. And that's why I chose what may be the most famous fighting game anime movie of all time. Street Fighter 2. It's the game that defined an entire generation. An undisputed classic that not only set the standard for all 2D fighters that have come after, but also became a cornerstone for video games as a whole. It introduced us to characters that have stood the test of time, all iconic in their own rights, and wholly symbolizing one of the largest video game companies in the world. The movie... not so much. <laughs> Look, I've been getting requests for this movie for a long time now, and I've been dragging my heels for as long as I could, but I can't hold it off any longer. This movie just doesn't work. No two ways about it. I know that this is a fondly remembered bit of nostalgia for some people, and I will fully admit that there are some bright spots here and there, but... Christ, is it a mess. Well, no use putting it off any longer. Time to ruin yet another old Taku memory. First, Let's get what the film did right out of the way. The fight choreography and animation. Even by today's standards, the level of detail is truly remarkable. Hell, the film opens with a classic bout, Sagat vs. Ryu. This fight is so good that it almost makes up for the fact that it keeps being interrupted by this annoying MS-DOS looking filter. You find out later that this is M. Bison gathering intel on all would-be fighters, and more on that later, but I wanted to point out these weird little categories this program is measuring. Apparently, this apparatus is capable of measuring a human being's bodily integrity from seemingly miles away, having no physical connection to him whatsoever. Better still, this program also has the ability to measure abstract concepts that have no tangible or physical presence. So you better grab your D6s, because it apparently can measure a person's leadership, judgment, perception, and you're gonna love this, a person's objectivity. It has the ability to objectively measure the subjective notion of a person's objectivity. Sagat has Ryu on the ropes, but he fights back by landing a wicked sweet dragon punch. Or sure you can if you're feeling purist. Ah yes, who could ever forget that classic line of Ryu's whenever he throws an Adoken? Da What an anti-climax. You're waiting as Sagat charges at Ryu, he's building up his energy for the most epic of Hadoukens, and he doesn't say it! It's not like they had to time any lip flaps, his mouth was hidden by his shoulder and the flash. There's no excuse! Still, this beginning makes a thousand promises for this movie, and then it proceeds to break nearly every single one of them. Oh sure, there are plenty of awesome fight scenes, but half of them are of absolutely no importance or consequence. We'll cover this more when we get to each individual scene, but suffice it to say, this movie treats fight scenes like Mel Brooks movies treats musical numbers. We begin the movie proper with Kami committing the least subtle assassination in the history of the world. BAM! That's all we see of Cammy. She immediately gets captured because no one is capable of being dense enough to miss that little circus act, and we see her only once later being interrogated. That's it. 
Which leads me to another of the film's problems. It's utterly wasted cast. I know that writing a film that has all of these characters is tricky, and I also know they needed to include all of them in the film to appease the fans. But if all they're going to do is have these glorified cameos, I'd prefer if they weren't in the film to begin with. Make a good movie first. Then worry about pleasing the fans. This timid little flower is Cammie White. What we know is that she's a special agent attached to MI6. Hmm, interesting report, Shun Lee, but tell me, did you not get the memo about office dress code policy? I just love the fact that Chun Li dresses in her combat outfit even at her Interpol office. You'd think her spiky wristbands would get in the way of her completing her TPS reports. She's being interrogated at base B, however, she claims to have no memory of the past three years. Which means... Which means, sir, she's being controlled somehow. Or she could be lying. Is there an opposite to Occam's razor? According to our data, Shadow Law is- Wait, 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 wait. Shadow Law? You know what? I'm actually fine with this change. No, really, I am. Shadow Lou always sounded weird to me as a word, like it was Napoleon's other great defeat that he doesn't like to talk about. At least Shadow Law sounds a bit more menacing and a bit more in line with what M. Bison is trying to do. Take over the world. Keep waiting for that clip to show up. I'm sure it'll happen. This walking mountain of muscle is called Sagat. He's a champion Muay Thai fighter and is considered a national hero in Thailand. Contestant number two is Balrog, whose penchant for violent behavior got him permanently banned from boxing. Oh yeah, because there's simply no room in boxing for violence! Chun-Li explains that in order for Interpol to take Shadow Law down, they're going to have to team up with the American military, which means Guile makes his entrance. But it's not long before we're smacked upside the head with yet another problem with the film. See if you can guess what it is. It takes the film three minutes, THREE MINUTES, to have M. Bison exit his jet and sit in his chair. That's all that happens! Holy hell does this movie drag its ass. The movie barely has a plot as it is, so when it pulls the drag shoot like this, it's damn near unbearable. The movie is about an hour and a half out of your life, but if you manage to cut out all the unnecessary characters and all the padding, you'd somehow be three minutes younger. It's about here we get our first earful of M. Bison, and he's no Raul Julia, but then again, who is? It's not that he does a bad job, it's just that the script is letting his performance go to waste. Whereas Raul had lines like this... The day Bison graced your village was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. Our M. Bison has lines like this... Any man strong enough to beat the crap out of Sagat is a man I want found. Just when you thought it wasn't possible to miss Raul Julia Moore. It seems that Bison here has had his eye on Ryu for some time now and is scouring the globe for him, since he's been wandering around more or less ceaselessly. A guy who wanders around the globe without ID. Yep, this is pre-9-11. By the by, if you were hoping I would make some kind of over 9,000 joke because of Ryu's power level here, what year do you think this is? I think the movie is self-aware because after it wastes even more time with a pointless flashback of Ryu doing Tai Chi on a cliff, it decides to give you whiplash. My iPod Shuffle playlist has less disorienting segues! I forgot to mention that Manga Video ponied up the cash to license a bunch of 90s alt-rock to put in the background, and they fit about as well as Crocs on the Queen of England. Or Crocs on anybody, for that matter. 
It's about here that the movie pumps the brakes and comes to a grinding halt and follows Ryu in his many misadventures with the rest of the street fighting crew. Curious thing though, he comes across Fei Long in China and supposedly Fei Long here is being played by Brian Cranston but the internet has not been able to confirm this. So clear the air once and for all Mr. Cranston. Did you play Fei Long in Street Fighter 2? One day, Bennett. One day. There's been a shortage of new blood around here lately. So what's your name? I'm just passing through here. Just a Japanese guy taking in a fight. You're about as Japanese as Mickey- Oh, never mind! So, after Ryu beats the shit out of Fei Long, Ken beats the shit out of Thunderhawk. And both fights come out of nowhere, and both Hawk and Long are never mentioned again. Then Ryu finds Dalsim and E. Honda fighting, and we never hear from Dalsim again. We go to see E. Honda later, but he's window dressing at best. Also, what the fuck is Akuma doing in Calcutta? There's little to no connective tissue between these scenes. They just happen in the plot, then they disappear into the ether as quickly as they came. And to make matters worse, M. Bison's plan is kind of bullshit. He's basically bullying politicians over the globe into doing what he says and assassinating all those who don't fall in line. So what does he want Ryu to join Shadow Law for? He's accomplishing his goal without his help and Ryu never showed any intentions of actively stopping him or Shadow Law. Why even bother? God, this is bugging me too much. Uh, play another Raul Julia clip. I was hoping to face Guile personally on the battlefield. One gentleman warrior to another, in respectful combat. Then I would snap his spine. Ah! The road not taken. <sighs> and Bison 2, you got anything to say for yourself? I don't give a shit. Why am I not surprised? And why am I not surprised that the Chun Li and Guile subplot is going nowhere? Nearly half an hour since we were introduced to them, we finally catch back up with them. So they could have a pointless cameo with DJ. No, not the Street Fighter character. I mean Dwayne Johnson. I came with a warning. Shadow Law's after you. Yahoo! They are some badass mothers. Oh god, what do they do to you, Bo Billingsley? Now I can't watch Bebop without picturing Jet Black covered in gold chains. Ugh. Bison gets word that Guile and Chun-Li are trying to get a bead on him and sends Vega after Chun-Li. But first we have to sit through a pointless fight scene between Zanjeef and Blanca. And before you even think to ask, yes, we never see either of them again. Hell, the fight doesn't even have a resolution. They just cut to Chun-Li's infamous shower scene halfway during the fight. Ah, uh, yes, the infamous shower scene. What Phoebe Kate's pool scene was to Fast Times at Ridgemont High, this was to Street Fighter 2. Yes, how shocking it must have been for young Otaku back then, learning that the girl they used to beat their friends with was capable of having actual nipple tits. Ah, <sighs> we were so innocent before the internet. I cannot lie though, the ensuing fight scene between Vega and Chun-Li is absolutely perfect. The tension is expertly built, the choreography is spot on, and there are some truly brutal moments that feel ripped straight out of a raid movie. And the music choice isn't bad either. My hobby is to slowly peel the skin off the rabbits I catch. Especially cute little bunnies like you. Hmm, if only the movie were more like this. AND LESS LIKE THIS! If you boys can appreciate my music, then you better haul your sorry asses out of here. With Chun-Li out of commission after her brutal beatdown on Vega, Guile contacts Interpol, assessing their new priority, which just happens to be Ken. As soon as I know things are stable, I'll catch the next flight to Seattle. Also, have a dossier on Ken Masters ready for me. Ah, oh, GOD! Ward a guy next time if you're gonna blast them bones, you fucking dicks! I swear this dub is actively trying to fuck with me. What is the point of playing Alice in Chains here? Is Ken a big grunge fan? Is he blasting it out of his car radio? Because if he is, then that song is far longer than I remember it being, because it takes the entire length of the day to get through it. 
Then again, if the song wasn't there, then it would just be an extended montage of Ken driving his Porsche. Worst Top Gear review ever. And it's here, an hour into the movie, that something actually plot relevant happens, as M. Bison swoops in and captures Ken after finding out that his abilities rival Ryu, since both learned from the same master. Which always bugged me. I mean, Ryu learning from Go Ken makes sense because of the whole adoptive father thing, but why Ken? The official backstory is that Ken was sent by his father to learn humility and discipline from Goken, who just happened to be a good friend of his. How the fuck did Ken's dad, a hotel tycoon, meet this backwoods martial arts master? And I only know that the masters are basically the Hiltons because I looked it up. If you just went by the movie, you would have no idea what Ken's family actually does. Own other families? My father, his father, and his father's father built the Master's Empire on one rickety, leaky slave ship and a simple slogan. People selling people to people. If you're cool, then you got that reference. Guile and company are too late to stop Bison from abducting Ken, so he hightails to Interpol, where they quickly formulate a plan to storm Bison's headquarters. But it seems Guile is more interested in showing off his sweet bod to comatose chicks. I've got some good news. I came to tell you that we found Bison's hideout. I guess you'll chew me out for this, but I'll get revenge for what he did to both of us. Looks like M. Bison's gonna get two tickets to the gun show, yeah! Guile manages to get a beat on Ryu's location, as he's been mountain climbing in Thailand for no reason, having painfully constructed flashbacks to when he was training with Ken. But Bison, being the take charge kind of asshole he is, decides to beat Guile to the punch and sends a newly brainwashed Ken after them. He's known as Violent Ken according to the canon, but if it's all the same to you, I'll just stick with Ken. With our cast finally assembled, it's time to wrap this puppy up with a good old fashioned brawl. And again, credit where credit's due, the fights are just top notch and the animation is simply beautiful. Well, most of the time anyway. I'm a welcome wagon. It's nice to meet you, friend. Mama said knock you out. It takes a while, but Ken manages to snap himself back into his senses, having been reminded of who Ryu is. So, of course you're expecting Ryu and Ken to double-team M. Bison and beat his ass into jelly, right? Well, that happens, but not before the movie decides to waste even more time! Ken is knocked out, but pulls himself up and then meditates, while Ryu is getting the shit kicked out of him. Focus the mind. Cleanse the soul. Focus. Don't lose it now. But he comes around and the two manage to incinerate Bison with a double hot token, saving the day by wiping him off the face of the earth. Or do they? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I want to laugh at that ridiculous ending, but I'm already laughing at their choice of music. Of all the bands they could have chosen, they wind up going with fucking corn. Holy hell, that is the cherry on top of this shit Sunday. And I mean it, this movie is just the pits to sit through. Again, yes, the fight scenes and animation are spectacular, but these scenes are strung together with a veritable fart of a story and plot. With a cast of at least a dozen characters, they managed to include them all, but had them do absolutely nothing. Hell, even Chun-Li and Guile did nothing to help stop Bison in the grand scheme of things. In fact, that's what this movie is, summed up in a phrase. A big pile of nothing. If all you wanted from a Street Fighter movie was awesome fight scenes, then why not just play the video game? At least that way you don't have to be assaulted by corn at the end of it. Eesh. Well, 
We started this month on a depressing note, and it's only going to get worse from here, motherfuckers! Till next time! <laughs>